I work at Analytic. This is a Silicon Valley startup where we all like mutually share the dream of data-driven medicine with the goal of bringing patients like radically improved diagnostic outcomes. And that sounds really broad because our dreams are really broad and we have like a lot of multimodal data from a lot of different sources. So reports, images, some genetics, some other stuff. And that makes the use of deep learning even more necessary. So we invest a lot into our technology and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm not like a executive -y type. I'm more of like the guy who works on the algorithm -y stuff. And there's other extremely challenging issues that my colleagues are working on to make that dream a reality. But I'm just going to focus on the deep learning aspects of it. But happy to answer anything in a Q&A. For this talk, I'm hopefully going to convince you that deep learning is awesome if you don't know that yet. I assume that you know that if you're here and you've listened to the last three talks. Um, but there are some limitations to it that I think most people don't realize that I'd like to discuss, especially these, how these limitations can be relevant in a medical context. And if we have time, that might be a little bit technical, how I think the deep learning community is going to make that better. So deep learning is awesome. Hopefully we know that. There get state-of-the-art results on supervised learning with um, ResNets. This was the recent 150-layer um, architecture someone mentioned. They've actually increased it to, is it 1,200, I think, very recently, within a few months. And semi-supervised learning with ladder networks and unsupervised learning or generative modeling with uh, DC GANs. And I actually think that uh, we currently hold the state of the art on CIFAR 10 with normal data augmentation and CIFAR 100. But the, how fast the research is moving nowadays is like could have easily been beaten when I was on the flight or something like that. Um, there's a lot of important problems in medicine that can't be cast as a standard machine learning problem. But luckily, deep learning is not limited to tabular data, and I think this is one of like, the most appealing aspects of it. It can take in sequence problems like genetics or text reports and output them as sequences in like, the very famous sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning framework where you have a recurrent net as an encoder and a recurrent net as a decoder. And you can basically, if you are willing to have enough data, train basically any problem with that. Um, the, uh, you can use deep learning on gr arbitrary graphs, so not just limited to um, images or s signals, and you can like, generalize the convolution to graphs, which is a really cool insight since a lot of problems are represented only as graphs. And you can even use it to solve discrete optimization problems with uh, pointer networks. And you can like, have neural networks which can do things like sort in linear time or do all sorts of cool things like that. They can be used to generate art. So this has been like, pretty popular recently where they just generate all sorts of like, really cool images. And I love boosted decision trees as much as the next person. But the only thing it's drawn for me are like, partial dependence plots. And like, these are pretty amazing. And a popular thing like, that usually when you talk to your friends about deep learning, you show them something like word vectors. When you take the vector of king, you subtract the vector of man, you add the vector of woman, and it results in the vector of queen. And like, that is basically a result from I think it was three years ago. And nowadays, you can do much cooler things like combining a picture of myself with that of a Pikachu and like creating like novel images like that, which I think is really, really cool. Of course, there's stuff relevant to medicine. How clear is that? That's not very clear. Um, it's, deep learning can be used to diagnose cancer. One of the things that we're working on is localizing and classifying malignant lung nodules. And it can get like superhuman results at this, which is pretty amazing, which is just because like, that's a very hard problem and that's one that it's not like a kind of problem that humans are very good at. Humans are actually quite bad at it if you measure them. So if you needed another reason not to get lung cancer, that's not one. Um, and all of that is really, really good. There's three extremely important properties of deep learning that make it an amazing fit for medical data. Number one is the extensibility in the, where you have like this idea of composing powerful yet optimizable subcomponents into a graph. It's very, very elegant, and it gives it like a huge amount of modularity and flexibility. A really cool example that we have here is um, I work a lot on medical imaging, and when a radiologist looks at an image, they, uh, this thing has, I think, 12 bits of information normally, so there's a lot of information there, and usually the human visual system can't really tell all of that, tell the difference between all the, like, the little different shades of gray. So what they do is they window they're, they basically clip into a certain range in the images. That way you can look only in a certain range, so you can look at the bone range or something like that. And that way you can like, distinguish between very subtle differences. 
and we thought that this was a really cool idea, so we just made a neural network component that allows you to like zoom into a certain range as well. And this actually managed to learn the exact same ranges that humans learned, like plus or minus like a few percentage points. And this is pretty, a pretty interesting thing, and I feel like these kinds of things give a lot of insight into how the human visual system might work, just because uh, neural networks can easily distinguish between 12 bits of information. Um, scalability is a huge issue with medical data. I see like every single doctor as a data silo in a way, in that they, as they grow, they get better, hopefully, and they see tons of cases, and with all the cases they see, and they get better and better over time, but all of that goes away when they retire or when they pass away or they decide to do something else. But the idea behind this now is that now that we're collecting this data, like this data is gonna be there forever. Like once we have like a disease that like, oh, we see this example of a disease, we could train that on a model like that exists 100 years from now and people will be able to like reap the benefits of that no matter who your doctor is, no matter where you live, no matter how much money you have. And that's a really important property if we're trying to like really scale this kind of thing out. And another one that's been touched on um, by the previous talk uh, is transfer learning. The, uh, since the goal of deep learning is representation learning, once you have re these representations, life can be much, much easier. So imagine you had like this amazing genomics network, and you also had like this radiology network, and you can use like some low dimensional representation of what their genome means to condition your network to make more informed predictions on like uh, what is normal for this person or what is bad for a person, right? Because maybe they just look weird, but and their genomics can tell you that, but the image won't. Or what you can do is you can have like a NLP network which takes into account how a person is feeling or like prior indications, and that can make a neural network just search much more intelligently through an image, since like these are like very, very big volumes, which can be computationally quite heavy. So there's a lot of really interesting things that can be done, like once you have these little networks that you can like just plug together and get all sorts of new properties from. And this framework, like all together, it seems like it could solve, it's general enough at least, to solve a lot of medical problems. So the question is, what is stopping us from having these seemingly optimal doctors? And I think that there's a bunch of related issues here. Um, I'm not going to get into all of them because I feel like that's a very technical topic, but I can touch on a few of them in a high, from a high level. It's that optimization is a, a big one where you can construct these optimizable graphs, like you know, plugging all of these really cool architectures together or making a 100 layer network. But sometimes uh, the, the kinds of things you put together, even though they're individu individually optimizable, like when you put it all together, it just doesn't work. And like that's a problem that we just, like if you ask any uh, legitimate researcher, they, they might have some gut feel, but it's one that we just don't have an answer to yet. And sometimes people have to do incredible, incredibly inelegant things in order to get working. There was a recent paper called, I think it's called Neural GPUs Learn Algorithms, where they had to have the same layer have, at the start of training, six different sets of weights, but eventually converge into one, which you'd never think is like an obvious thing to do and never think it's the right thing to do, um, like in general. Efficiency is another one, not only in like the code running fast, but parameter and data efficiency. In particular, if you're willing to give up back propagation, which a lot of deep learning is built on top of right now, and you use things like evolutionary algorithms, for example, you can get the same kinds of architectures learn in much, much fewer parameters than a neural network does. And I've seen estimates as like much as two orders of magnitude, which is just a crazy amount like more parameters than necessary. So it seems like the algorithms we have yet are not, not quite there yet. Um, creativity is obviously a big issue for research, and research is something I focus on a lot, just because if these problems were solved, we would all be immortal, right? Um, and flexibility is something that I work on a lot as well, just because um, as an engineer, there's a lot of like real world limitations into the kinds of things that you can do, and the kinds of things that you can build are just very limited right now in the, the, the framework that exists. Um, a principle that I have and that I've like taken with me for quite a long time is that the tools you use shouldn't limit the way you think. And every time you have like an idea that takes too much effort to try, um, that's an indicative of a flaw in the tools you use, since like effort is a function of your environment. 
and your environment is the tooling. So every time you have some crazy idea or like some crazy, I want a network that um, can take in, uh, like an example is if you have MRIs, you have like different pulse sequences, but they kind of measure the same thing um, in a different way. So is there any way you could like share the downstream architecture, but like learn a different kernel for each kind of pulse sequence as a function of the input? Because you don't need, like sometimes the data is messy and you don't know what pulse sequence you're actually given since so it's a gray area. I'm not going to get into it, but um, it's, there's a lot of really interesting things that I feel like could be done that people just aren't doing. And I, I believe the, the limitations and tools we use. So these things can be really easy when you think of it as like a standard continent where you have like convolution, a pooling, a convolution, a pooling, you know, three fully connected layers or something like that, which is like a very standard architecture. I believe this one is from 20-ish years ago and some of them are still used today. But sometimes there's techniques that are just much more complicated but give much more benefit. So this is an example of a pretty advanced learning rate schedule where every single epoch, I believe, you have a, a different learning rate and all of this is learned. And these are the kinds of things that the tools we use just don't enable right now. So we, like, we have some research that shows like this is, might be a smart thing to do, but we don't have the ability to utilize that information, which is problematic. Um, today's tools make like adding, you know, composing together layers really simple. And um, that is a pretty simple case. But uh, a lot of the other stuff that like people write about and research about and like build one-off scripts to do is number one, they, a lot of it looks really important to try. And like I want to like try all of it in a medical problem because like not everyone is working on this stuff. Um, but it also becomes unnecessarily difficult. So I'm going to give a few examples of this, but um, it's, uh, and I, by today's tools, I mean like very low-level frameworks like Theano, TensorFlow, um, MXNet, Torch, Cafe. Um, and not all of these apply to every single one because every tool is different, but no tool makes all of these easy, which I think is a big problem with like today's deep learning being unnecessarily inflexible. So nodes with costs. So when you have like a layer which has like a specific cost in them, these kinds of things are just very difficult to like plug into an existing architecture, even though like conceptually they seem very, very simple. Like if you want an output unit with a different L2 cost on its weight or something like that, which is, a, I mean, there was a paper on it showing that this is like really good to do and is often better than a softmax, which is what everyone uses nowadays. Um, there's nodes with non-differentiable updates. Basically, I think almost every framework had to do some amount of uh, refactoring in order to enable batch normalization, which is like probably like one of the biggest achievements in the last year in deep learning. Um, just allowed crazy speed ups on training as well as training architectures that were much, much harder to train before. So you couldn't train the 1,000 layer networks without this before. And most frameworks did not have a concept of how do you create something like this in a network. There is Sometimes you have costs with parameters where you have a transformation on the objective function that you're using in order to make it more convex or something like that. Um, there's gradient transformations, which most frameworks support like very basic things like gradient clipping. Like anyone who uses a recurrent net, I assume, uses gradient clipping. But like there's these kinds of new transformations like adding random noise to the gradient, which seems unintuitive, but people have shown to be helpful, which just can be like very tricky to use. Um, replacing parameters is a very popular one. Um, a lot of frameworks make like, uh, making even a simple autoencoder difficult just because you want to tie your weight matrix to the transpose when you're decoding. Uh, or making, like I mentioned previously, making a convolutional kernel some sort of function of your input. And there's actually, I probably should have added some papers that recently do this to um, like extremely, to be extremely, extremely effective of being a potential batch normalization replacement um, called weight normalization, where you do the transformation in your parameters instead of in your um, activations. Uh, modified update rules. I feel like everyone uses like the same five update rules and people have shown these to be suboptimal in some ways, but the, the, these things are just hard to tweak and there's all sorts of different things where people just do crazy hacky stuff. So if you look at RMS prop, for example, one of the more popular learning rules, I believe 
there's like maybe like three or four different implementations that exist that are slightly different, but no one really put them together because DeepMind had this one version from before Hinton posted his slides, and then um, Alex Graves, I believe, before he was in DeepMind or something like that, has a, his own version that he published about. And there's all sorts of like different tweaks in these that makes it really hard for a practitioner to just try the best thing that's possible. And I feel like in order for us to like move forward, we all need to be able to easily try these best things that are possible. Um, alternative optimizers can be quite hard in some frameworks, which have been shown to be useful, especially for recurrent networks. Um, there's a lot of like little fine customization that people just assume that practitioners don't want. Um, so when you want to like compose together these subnetworks, you might want to freeze some of them because you don't have enough data to fine tune like a genomics net when you're training an image conf net at the same time. Um, Hyperparameter schedules is another one that is a big one. And to me, like this is actually one of the biggest things that if you talk to people. Um, uh, like any normal deep learning person, and you hear them talk about multi-stage pipelines, and I've actually chatted with a few of them. I had a chat with Ilya Sutskever about this, and the moment I mentioned this, he was like, you, you shouldn't like them, they are bad. And then you hear Ben and Frey talk about like, these like, multiple stages of learning, and I believe that it may not be the correctest way to do it, but it's a way that I think that we need to do it for now to make up for the flaws in our algorithms. So normally in engineering, being able to like separate your pipeline is a really good thing. You can cache the intermediates, you can understand the middle, you can like poke and prod the in intermediate parts and understand them better, and optimize each of them independently. And we should love utilizing easier subproblems, but everyone in the deep learning world basically says like, we just want to do everything end to end, and if it's not end to end, that's too much trouble. And to me, this is just like a very unintuitive way of like us justifying that this kind of thing is just harder than it has to be. And this kind of, this is the kind of thing I think that we really need to move forward because for now we're solving problems that humans can't understand, but what happens when we want to like put together these things to, in a way that humans can't currently understand? And like we have to do that because there's a lot of problems in medicine where we just don't understand what's going on. There's a lot of other tricks that I'm not going to super get into. Um, but there's lots of little things that we just are unnecessarily hard to do. And a, a question that we've asked ourselves at Analytic is, can we do better? And uh, we believe that we can. I, I don't have too much time to talk about this stuff, but we've made a few attempts at making things better. So one of the things that we've uh, been playing with is architectures that interpolate between easy to optimize architectures and very, like, expressible architectures, like the kind that people use today. And we've played a bunch with these things, and um, it's just the beginning, and I hope we will be able to open source the tooling we have for this, as well as some of the data sets that we have. But that's still a uh, work in progress. So from a high level, um, I think that the tools we need, like deep learning as a science, is, seems to be there already. Like deep learning, what we have already, it seems like, we can solve a lot of really hard problems with it. There's no like, huge barriers from solving the kinds of problems that we at least want to solve. But we need to apply it. We need to be able to like, put these things together. We need to just try a bunch of things, uh, put as much effort that people have put into ImageNet, as, uh, into put the same amount of effort that people put into ImageNet into a problem that actually is meaningful. And I think that we'll see like, some really awesome results. And this all should be easy, because I mean, we all want to be able to do this stuff. So. High level is that deep learning is awesome. I think the tools we have currently limit how we do that. And uh, in the short term, I believe the community is going to fix that through better tooling. Uh, thank you. <laughs>